Welcome to Transcend Awards. Risk controls in schools and childcare environments. Duties associated with risk assessment. Schools must assess the risks to all who are affected by school activities associated with infectious disease, which includes staff, pupils, visitors, and contractors. Schools must introduce measures which include safe operating procedures to manage those risks. Schools must communicate risks and controls through safe operating procedures to all employees. Schools must record the significant findings of the risk assessment. Schools must conduct regular review of the risk assessment, especially when there is a change. Infectious Disease Prevention Controls The Department of Education have identified risks and confirmed explicit controls which will prevent the transmission of infectious disease in schools. Risks are associated with contracting a range of diseases. Controls include Promotion and advocacy for immunisations Good hygiene practice Effective management of injuries and bites. Robust procedures to manage animals. Rigorous precautions for vulnerable children. Rigorous precautions for pregnant staff. Let's look at each control in detail to enable schools to embed these into safe operating procedures designed to prevent transmission of infectious disease. Immunisation controls. Duties of schools associated with immunisation controls include check immunisation records at school entry and at the time of any vaccination, encourage parents to have their children immunised, encourage parents to organise missed immunisation or catch up doses with the child's GP, monitor and facilitate the National Immunisation Schedule. Support vulnerable children who require additional immunisations. Ensure that all staff are up to date with their immunisations. Hygiene controls via hand washing. Stringent hand washing controls is one of the most important ways of controlling the spread of infections especially those that cause diarrhoea, vomiting and respiratory disease. Recommendations include Use of liquid soap, warm water and paper towels for 20 seconds as a minimum. All cuts and abrasions are covered with a waterproof dressing. All staff and pupils to wash their hands oh, 3, 2, 1 all staff and pupils to wash their hands after using the toilet, before eating or handling food and after touching animals. Small children to be taught a hand wash song to make sure they complete the recommended hand wash time. During times of outbreak or pandemic, hand washing schedules must increase. Children could be encouraged to wash hands at the start of every class and immediately after being in the playground. Hygiene controls via coughing etiquette. Coughing and sneezing etiquette is essential to prevent the spread of disease. This should occur at all times and teachers are encouraged to introduce this as a common preventative measure. Children and adults should be encouraged to cover their mouth and nose with a disposable tissue when coughing or sneezing at all times. Children and adults must be required to wash hands after using or disposing of tissues. Spitting should be discouraged at all times just by way of good manners. During an outbreak, children must be made aware of the seriousness of this. Children and adults should be encouraged to dispose of tissues immediately after use. During times of outbreak or pandemic, 
Coughing and sneezing etiquette reminders must increase and tissues be made more readily available. Hygiene controls via stringent cleaning practices. Stringent cleaning techniques can help to prevent the development and spread of infection. Cleaning the environment, equipment and toys are all essential. A nominated member of staff should be chosen to monitor cleaning standards and discuss any issues with cleaning staff. Cleaning contracts and schedules must clearly describe the activities needed, the frequency and who will carry them out. A comprehensive cleaning contract to include daily, weekly and periodic cleaning schedules based on national guidance. Cleaning staff should be appropriately trained and have access to personal protective equipment. Cleaning contracts and standards should be monitored regularly by the school. Colour-coded equipment is the best method to prevent infection. Examples include red for toilets and washrooms, yellow for hand wash basins and sinks, green for kitchens and blue for general areas, equipment and toys. Cleaning solutions should be used and stored in accordance with control of substances hazardous to health regulations or COSH. Cleaning equipment must be changed and decontaminated regularly. Cloths must be disposable or disinfected after every use. During times of outbreak, cleaning schedules must be enhanced to reduce risk of transmission. Hygiene controls via cleaning of toys and play equipment. Hygiene includes robust cleaning of toys and play equipment. The cleaning schedule should identify who, what, when and how toys should be cleaned and be monitored. It is recommended that only hard toys are used to enable them to be wiped clean after play. Any damaged items that cannot be cleaned or repaired must be discarded. Play-Doh should be replaced regularly and should be included in the cleaning schedule. Sand pits should be securely covered when not in use to prevent contamination. Sand should be changed regularly. Indoor pits should have sand changed every four weeks. The sand must be sieved regularly to keep clean. Outdoor pits should have the sand changed as soon as it becomes discoloured. The sand must be raked regularly to keep clean. Soft toys, play-doh and sand pits should not be used during a time of outbreak or pandemic. Toys should not be shared during an outbreak or pandemic unless they have been wiped clean. Hygiene controls via cleaning of blood and body fluid spills. Hygiene controls include robust cleaning of blood and body fluid spills. All spillages of blood, faeces, saliva and vomit should be cleaned up immediately wearing personal protective equipment. Spillages must always be cleaned using a product which combines detergent and disinfectant. It is effective against both bacteria and viruses. Manufacturer's instructions must be followed. Disposable paper towels or cloths must be used to clean blood and body fluid spills and disposed of after use. A spillage kit must be available for blood spills. When managing any situation, which includes first aid or cleaning of blood or bodily fluids, you must always wear disposable gloves and plastic aprons. Gloves should be disposable, non-powdered vinyl or latex free and CE marked. You should also wear goggles if there is a risk of splashing to the face. Hygiene controls via sanitation. Hygiene depends on adequate sanitary facilities. A hand wash basin with warm running water along with a mild liquid soap, preferably wall mounted with disposable cartridges, should be available. Bar soap should not be used. Disposable paper towels must be placed next to basins in wall mounted dispensers together 
with a nearby foot-operated waste paper bin. Toilet paper should be available in each cubicle. If schools or childcare settings experience problems with overuse, they could consider installing paper dispensers to manage this. Suitable sanitary disposal facilities should be provided where there are female staff and pupils aged 9 or over, junior and senior age groups. Pupils who use continence aids such as continence pads or catheters should be encouraged to be as independent as possible. The principles of basic hygiene should be applied to both pupils and staff. Continence pads should be changed in a designated area. Disposable powder-free non-sterile latex gloves and a disposable plastic apron should be worn. Gloves and aprons should be changed after every use. Hand washing facilities should be readily available and you can contact your school health team for further advice. Hygiene controls via nappy management. Hygiene controls include effective nappy management. Children in nappies must have a designated changing area away from play facilities and from any area where food or drink is prepared or consumed. Hand washing facilities must be available in the room so that staff can wash and dry their hands after every nappy change before handling another child or leaving the nappy changing room. A designated sink must be allocated for cleaning potties, which is not a hand wash basin. This must be located where potties are used. Household rubber gloves must be used to flush contents. The potty should be washed in hot soapy water, dried and stored upside down. Soiled nappies should be wrapped in a plastic bag before disposal in the general school waste. Children's skin must be cleaned with disposable wipes. Flannels should never be used and nappy creams and lotions labelled with the child's name and not shared with others. Changing mats must be cleaned with soapy water or a wipe after each use. Mats should be cleaned thoroughly with hot soapy water at the end of every day and discarded if there is any damage. It is advised to package nappy waste separately from other waste streams. Those that produce significant amounts of used nappies should contact their local authority to discuss appropriate disposal arrangements. Rubber gloves should be washed whilst wearing them and then wash and dry hands after taking them off. Hygiene controls via effective laundry management. Hygiene includes effective laundry and contaminated clothing controls. There should be a designated area on site if there is a need for laundry facilities. This area should be separate from any food preparation areas, have appropriate hand washing facilities, have a washing machine with a sluice or pre-wash cycle. Staff involved with laundry services should ensure that Manual sluicing of clothing is not carried out as this can subject the operator to inhale fine, contaminated aerosol droplets. Soiled articles of clothing should be rinsed through in the washing machine pre-wash cycle prior to washing. Gloves and aprons are worn when handling soiled linen or clothing and hands are thoroughly washed before and after removing gloves. If clothing of either the child or the first aider becomes contaminated with blood or body fluids. Clothing should be removed as soon as possible, placed in a plastic bag and sent home with the child, with advice for the parent on how to launder the contaminated clothing. The advice should confirm that clothing should be washed separately in a washing machine, using a pre-wash cycle on the hottest temperature that the clothes will tolerate. Robust procedures for cuts, bites and bleeds. Hygiene includes effective controls in the event of a cut, bite or bleed. Staff should be aware of the school health and safety policy and manage situations such as cuts, bites and bleeds according to that policy. This includes the identification and training 
of nominated first aiders for the school. If a cut or bite does not break the skin, clean with soap and water, take no further action. If a cut or bite breaks the skin, use gloves to clean immediately with soap and running water. Record incident in the accident book. Seek medical advice as soon as possible. In seeking medical advice, you should solicit information to treat potential infection, to protect against hepatitis B and to gain reassurance for HIV infection. Needles used to manage conditions must be handled with care in accordance with policy. In the event that a child or member of staff does injure themselves with a hypodermic needle, make sure this is discarded in line with policy and then wash wound with soap and water, cover with waterproof plaster, record the incident in the accident book, seek immediate medical attention from A&E. Robust procedures to manage animals. Pets can enhance the learning experience for pupils, but they can also increase risk of infection, including gastrointestinal infection, fungal infections, and parasites. It is essential to ensure robust procedures to prevent this. Only mature and toilet trained pets should be considered, and the head teacher should ensure that a knowledgeable person is responsible for the animal. There should be a written agreement within the school detailing the types of animals allowed in the school, how to manage them and permitted behaviour whilst on the premises, where they can and cannot go in the school, any insurance liability of owners and handlers. Animals should always be supervised when in contact with the children and those handling animals advised to wash their hands immediately afterwards. Animals should have recommended treatments and immunisations, be regularly groomed including claws trimmed and checked for signs of infection. Bedding should be laundered regularly. Cat litter trays should be cleaned daily wearing disposable gloves. It should not be placed near food preparation, storage or eating areas. Wash hands immediately after removing gloves, but pregnant staff members should not carry out this task because of the risk of toxoplasmosis. Feeding areas should be kept clean and their food stored away from human food. Food not consumed in 20 minutes should be taken away or covered to prevent attracting pests. Robust procedures for vulnerable children. Rigorous precautions for vulnerable children, in this context, refers to those children that have impaired immune defense mechanisms in their bodies. This is known as immunocompromised, and these children are more likely to acquire infections. The consequence of infection in children that are immunocompromised is likely to be significantly more serious than in those with a properly functioning immune system known as immunocompetent. Impaired immunity can be caused by certain treatments such as those for leukemia or other cancers like cytotoxic therapy and radiotherapy. Other treatments such as high doses of steroids, enteral feeding and others may also have a similar effect. To ensure rigorous precautions to prevent communicable disease in vulnerable children, the school action the information from the parents and the child's doctors. The risk assessment must reflect the need to support the child in line with clear instruction. This may be different for each child. The child's teachers and support team must be informed and trained where necessary on the steps they need to prevent harm. If a vulnerable child is thought to have been exposed to a communicable disease, such as chickenpox or measles in school, the parents or guardians should be informed promptly so they can seek immediate medical advice. Robust precautions for staff. All staff should undergo a full occupational health check 
before starting employment, ensuring they are up to date with immunizations, including measles, mumps and rubella. If a pregnant woman develops a rash or is in direct contact with someone with a rash who is potentially infectious, she should consult her doctor or midwife. Food handlers and catering staff may present a particular risk to the health of their pupils and staff if they become infected with diseases that can be transmitted to others through food or drink. Food handling staff suffering from such diseases must be excluded from all food handling activity until advised by the local environmental health officer that they are cleared to return to work. There are legal powers for the formal exclusion of such cases but usually voluntary exclusion will suffice with off work certificates from the GP. Thank you for watching. Feel free to watch as many times as you need or move on to the next part of your digital learning experience on your list.